concrete walls There's a place for us Where we could go, where we could be alone Between city lights, we don't have to hide I wanna go, do you wanna follow? There's something in the air, I can't explain it but it's there Ain't nobody gonna find us in our secret love affair I don't wanna have to hide no more, it shouldn't be I wanna go and I wanna know Do you wanna follow? What's up? What's up, stream? Y'all ready to stream? What? Hello. I'm Joshua Bardwell. It's Sunday afternoon. It's 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, but this this is not Eastern time. No, this is the European stream. This is the time when I stream for all the people over uh, in the Europe who want to tune in for my Q&A live stream. How's it going, everybody? <clears throat> Y'all ready to ask some questions? I'm ready to give some answers. <clears throat> mm. Whew. Strong start to the stream. <laughs> What's up, Portugal? Hello, Netherlands. Hello, Greece. Hello, France. Don't get me wrong. Americans are welcome on this stream, too. But I scheduled this stream for earlier in the day so that all the fans in Europe who can't turn in the late in the evening can get in. Buechi FPV points out that LEDs are working on F3 boards using this build. Very nice. Um, <clears throat> let's get started. Uh, we're going to do some Q&A. Y'all are going to ask questions. I'm going to... Ew, Americans. Yeah, I know. Some of us do not watch football on Saturday, on Sunday afternoon. It's not even football season, I don't think. <laughs> Scotland. Scotland. I'm sorry. Did Air Real FPV, does it get annoying that anytime you mention from your, you're from Scotland, it just invites the person to do a really bad Scottish accent? Is, I, let me ask you guys this. What other accent in the world is so widely beloved, absolutely beloved, but also like everyone just thinks they can do a Scottish accent, can't they? Is that just an American thing? Let me ask you this. If you're from Scotland, anybody in the chat from Scotland, if you're an American, they hear you from Scotland, they instantly start imitating a Scottish accent. But 
Does that happen in any other countries of the world? Hmm? Australian, yes. Russian, hmm. Yeah, hmm. As long as everybody who accepts the metric system, everybody is welcome. <laughs> um, anyway. So here's what we're doing. Here's what we're doing. If you're new here, and by the way, if you're new here, welcome. Welcome to the channel. Uh, my deal is I have an illness that causes me to want to spend all day answering people's questions about quadcopters. Um, so uh, that's what we're going to do here. And in case, let me just catch you up. This is what I'm looking at on my main screen. I got the Q&A here, right? Q&A. This is uh, the chat from you guys scrolling by. Anybody's welcome to ask questions, and I will do my best to answer them. But as you can imagine, they go, look how fast it's going by. They go by way too fast for me to possibly answer them all. Hello, Denmark. So if you want to make sure that your question gets called out and gets some attention, uh, one thing you can do is you can hit this dollar sign right here. That's a super chat, and it causes your question to get popped out into this separate window. You throw a couple bucks at me, and I, I'm guaranteed – Almost guaranteed. Every so often I miss a super chat, but I try not to. So you can hit that and you'll make sure to get to your question. I try and do about 50-50. I try and, you know, I, 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 not everybody has to pay to get, get their question answered. Um, and then the other thing that I got over here, look, this is my Discord server. I do have a Discord server and people always ask, well, then how do I get on it? And you get on it by joining my Patreon. There's a link to my Patreon down in the video description. And one of the benefits of being a patron is that you do get, hello, Jamer. You do get, hi, DJ Pop. You do get into the Discord server and, uh, you know, you just got another channel where you can try to ask me questions. <clears throat> Wiccan FPV wants to know if I can do some work on Kikute F7 to get the RPM filter going. I, Wiccan FPV, that's the dev's job. I, if it's like I just follow the instructions and flash the firmware and cross my fingers and hope it's freaking, you know. Uh, so hmm. if it's not working, I'm not the guy who's going to get it working. <laughs> Jason FPV, no, I do not have a 3D printer. The reason I don't have a 3D printer is number one, they're super. So here's your choices when you get a 3D printer. You can get something like an Ender Mark III, which is a few hundred bucks, and then you can spend a ton of time and more money trying to make it print good. Or you can spend like eight or eight hundred, a thousand dollars on something like a Prusa. I think I might have said that wrong. A Prusa, Prusa, Joseph Prusa. And they come as close to ready to print as anything you can imagine. They're they're the closest to like an – but they're so expensive. And at the end of the day, whenever I need 3D printed stuff, I'm – and then you have to learn how to use it, right? You have to learn how to do 3D design, et cetera. It's, I just have so much work and fun with quads that getting into 3D printing has never seemed like a good a good investment of my time. So, mm. I want to start the stream. I always try and start the stream with just a little bit of kind of news of the day. And uh, today, I'm thinking of here's what I'm thinking about today. No wrong window. What? What? That's not the right. My streaming software is messed up. What? It's. Hold on. Wow. Okay. Well, that's not working. My streaming software is showing the wrong screen. Hold on. What the hell? Wow. That's something. Okay, let's do this. Okay, here's what I want to talk about today. Why did... Dude. Okay. Well, I guess we won't be using that source. This is what I want to talk about. FPV goggles just changed forever. Skyzone O2X is insane value. Um, so first of all, oh, interesting. Everything just changed forever again. Wow. I, 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 I'll say this. I'll say this. And don't get me wrong. Stu's awesome. I love Stu. Stu's a buddy. Stu and I, Stu and me and Bachgrinder did an Apex Legends stream a little while back. We had a wonderful time. But I do, I do feel like there's a place where I like to pick on Stu. And I'll say this, if everything ever stops changing forever, his channel's going to be in real big trouble. It sort of seems like everything changes forever. Nothing will ever be the same again, like on the monthly, at least. And that's great. That has really launched him to a lot of success. 
and uh, and uh, he deserves it. So this the Sky Zone O2X goggles from Sky Zone, and I would just say this: I have to be very careful with what I say to avoid. Now here's the problem: when I say this, y'all are going to start guessing what I'm not saying, and the problem is that if I say anything more then I will be re revealing too much. So the alternative is to say nothing at all, but I've already ruined that. So you, I'm not going to tell you anything more than you should wait like five days. If you're thinking about buying these goggles, wait like five days. That's all I can say. And now, you, now you're, now you're going to start guessing in the chat. And I, unfortunately, this is the the line I have to walk because I can't get I can't tell you anything more than that without saying too much. That's all. That's all I'm going to give you. That's already probably too much, but I feel safe saying that. I'm not saying anything else. And then here's the thing: at this, I. I at this point, some people start going, oh, my God, there's something new and amazing coming. And I like, I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is if you're if you're thinking about changing everything forever with the Sky Zone, just wait a few days, then make your decision. <clears throat> okay. Liner uh, asks, is Banggood a good store to buy stuff and reliable? Liner, that's a tough question. Uh, Banggood is, here, I mean, I'm going to go to my, here's what I say on my website. Why does my, uh, uh, wait, uh, wait a minute. Left monitor, right monitor, they're backwards. What? My monitors are backwards somehow. Oh, at least I figured out how to sh share that monitor. Okay, great. So here on my website, sorry, when I try and stream, this is the, I'm sharing the wrong screen. Um, when I have a website, fpvknowitall.com, and on the website is the ultimate FPV shopping list. And on that website, sometimes I link to products from Banggood. And I actually have a, a whole page on my website. <clears throat> Apologize, sorry about that. Uh, if this will be your first time ordering from Banggood, you should know a few things. Here's what I say about ordering from Banggood. Let me just zoom in a little bit for those of you on mobile. The best way to describe vendors like Banggood, Alibaba, GetFPV, etc. is that if you're careful in what products you buy, you can get about a 6 out of 10 in quality for about a 3 out of 10 in price. You're not going to get a 9 out of 10. You're not going to get a 10 out of 10. Well, you could get a 6 out of 10 and you pay for a 3 out of 10 and you come out ahead. But every so often, you, you just get a, a... It doesn't work. Or it's not as described. You just get the wrong product. Or it dies as soon as you plug it in. <laughs> so when you... And Banggood customer service has been getting better. If you get a product from them and it's DOA or it's not as described... Sometimes you can get, you seldom get like a full refund, but sometimes they'll send you a replacement part or another product. It's a real crapshoot buying from them. But the thing is, there are some products that you simply can't get anywhere else very easily. And there are other products that are significantly cheaper. And if you're willing to take the gamble, then it's a, it's a gamble. You can save some money. And especially if you don't live in the United States, I, I, when I made I'm a while back, I made the decision to kind of like firmly embrace Banggood as being in the sort of group of vendors that I support. Like you notice, I don't link to GearBest very often, almost never. But I, I the re, one of the reasons I link I decided that about Banggood is that I hear from a lot of people who live overseas and struggle with shipping, shipping from Europe to play or from the United States to places like. Well, some countries is impossibly expensive, um, and even people inside Europe often ship, buy from Banggood because one way or another it's cheaper because Banggood lies about their customs value. But everybody does it. I don't know why. But when they buy from inside the EU, there's all kinds of taxes and stuff, and it's super expensive when they buy from Banggood. It isn't. So a lot of people around the world 
But in the U.S., it's just like, why would you buy from Banggood? Just buy from GetFPV, Race Day Quads, Rotorite Store, Pyrodrone, ReadyMade RC. There's so many great U.S.-based vendors. You could just have your pick. But a lot of people outside the U.S. don't. Anyway, so Banggood has its place. Is it a good vendor and reliable? Probably not. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't shop there. And a lot of people do shop there and are happy. So, Savin and Saucy wants to know what can cause high throttle oscillation. High throttle oscillation is usually excess P or D gain um, for your tune. If you have high throttle oscillation, the thing to do is to take TPA percent and raise it. Now, when you are using Betaflight 4.0, the default TPA is already quite high. What what the devs, yeah, License to Drive points out, Banggood is more reliable than random Chinese sellers on eBay. You're right about that. <laughs> You're right about that. Banggood does, but it used to be that Banggood didn't have customer service at all. And if you bought from them and you, you were just basically screwed, they have actually been trying hard to do better about customer service. They are still not as good as uh, a typical like US customer would expect. They will still give you the runaround and make you send them pictures and eventually maybe you get like a 50% refund but they're better than they used to be anyway uh continuing tpa the the betaflight devs actually added a whole lot of tpa to the default tune on betaflight 4.0 for those of you who may not know tpa stands for throttle pid attenuation and what it means is that as you raise the throttle past a certain point the p and the d gain are reduced and the reason for that is that as the motors spin faster and faster, the amount of thrust they make is, is nonlinear. So a P gain that is correct for low throttle will be too high for high throttle. And what happens without TPA is that as you go to full throttle, you bring out kind of little micro oscillations. Or if you tune for high throttle, at low throttle, the quad will be too soft. So TPA reduces the P and the D gain as the throttle goes up. The Betaflight devs actually, some of them have said that these little micro oscillations at high throttle can, can noticeably reduce your top end speed. Um, if you're doing top speed runs, it's very important to not have excessive P and D gain because the, you, the motors, instead of smoothly making the quad go faster, will be kind of oscillating and, and bouncing off the, the limiter, if you will. Um, so TPA, and the thing is, if you have Betaflight 4.0 and you have high throttle oscillations, your TPA is already like 50%. So I'm kind of like, I would normally say raise the TPA, but it's already kind of so high that I'm not sure that I would tell you to do that. So I don't know, but that, there you go. Wiccan FPV says, get FPV and race day quads, the only two stores I shop at. If they don't have it, I'll never own it. That is that is a, a, I agree. I mean, I agree. You just pick your vendor. But again, that is a privilege of living in the United States where we have so many great vendors to choose from. And we don't, I mean, obviously most places in the world could order from race day quads or get FPV, but they would pay an import tax and shipping is ridiculous and it's just not worth it. So... That's the other thing about ordering from Banggood. Leonardo J.R. Go says, yeah, it's two months in transit. Yeah, shipping from Banggood is pretty freaking ridiculous. Even if you get the expedited shipping, it's pretty ridiculous. Jacob Moncrief wants to know, please explain why X-Class is so good. Seems like we're going backwards in the evolution of race drones, plus they're so expensive. Jacob, you, here's the thing you got to know about X-Class. The whole point of X-Class is that it's for the spectators. The idea of X-Class is let's make a drone that is so big that people in the stands can see it and follow it. It's not – if you are a pilot and you're saying, I don't understand the point, it's not really for you. That That's not entirely true. The people who fly X-Class enjoy the challenge of building, tuning, and piloting a very large quad. But in every way, X-Class quads fly worse than smaller quads. They are not as agile. They are not as fast. 
you can make an X-Class quad go 120 miles an hour or whatever, but the speed record is always going to be, the, the top speed possible is always going to be something smaller and lighter. Um, I mean, unless you start like putting rocket engines on it or something. So X-Class quads are more expensive, less durable in a crash. They break easier and they fly worse than smaller quads. So what's the point? The point is that somebody out there said, as long as these quads only tailor to pilots, we're not going to get mainstream acceptance. Let's take a quad and put make it big enough that somebody in a stands can follow it and, and latch onto it and go, whoa, that's pretty cool. And then we can get more mainstream acceptance for racing. That's the idea. All righty. Here we got a couple super chats coming in. Dave Lockwood, thanks for five bucks. No question. Reset VTX or Reset Ret Set VX. Thanks for five pounds. Cool Breeze FPV, thanks for two bucks. Wants to know if that's a soda stream bottle. It is a soda stream bottle, although the drink that I'm using, it, I'm drinking at this moment is a strawberry watermelon and it is not actually carbonated. I didn't think like drinking carbonated drink and like burping throughout the stream would be the most uh, professional thing to do. Also, uh, let's take a speaking of professional. We'll take a minute and say thank you to my producer, Alex, over there. How's the stream been going? The audio pretty good, Alex? Yeah? It's all very good. Everybody, how's the audio sounding? Between concrete walls, there's a place for us. Where we could go, what? where we could be at. What? Did? I'm sorry. I should, I should have just left you out of the stream. I, the minute I say something, you get distracted. Just go back to doing your job. I'm sorry, guys. I apologize. That was, he was, he was, I should, I should just leave him alone. <clears throat> <clears throat> can a three can every three inch carry an action cam no luca kurt most three inch quads cannot easily carry something like a gopro it can be done somebody linked me to a bach grinder video where they put a gopro hero 7 on a on a little i think it's a little bqe three inch um kyle k alex is never going to actually be on the stream he lives over there in the booth trust me if you had seen us i'm just saying he's not he's got a face for radio Liner says, what about the Mamba stack? I can only find it on Banggood. The Diatone Mamba stack is pretty solid. Um, Diatone Mamba, they have a, a stack. Uh, no, it's, what do you mean it's only on Banggood? It's on Race Day Quads, isn't it? Here's a Race Day Quads, F405 and F40 ESC for freaking... This, I'm kind of skeptical that this could possibly exist. Freaking $45, you've got an F4 flight controller and a 40 amp ESC. Like, has anybody used this? Is it, is it, does it like die? Does the ESC like just a total piece of crap? I'm just asking because for 45, for, if you sold me, if you showed me a four in one ESC for 45 bucks, I'd be like, wow, that is bargain basement. So now you're telling me you're giving me a flight controller and an ESC for 45 bucks, and I'm like, really? If that is any good at all, that's a hell of a good bargain. I should add that to my to my shopping list. I should add this to my shopping list. Hang on. People are always asking me how often I update my shopping list. The answer is all, all the time. I just don't, I only update the actual items on the shopping list. I don't actually update the web page very often. <laughs> okay. Um, hello, Discord. Discord's over here. The patron's over in the Discord. Let's say hi and see what kind of questions they've got. Oh my God, we got so many questions. What's better for all around freestyle for rapid fire? Two Omni antennas or an Omni and a patch? Um, in my testing... Tony Briz, two Omni antennas on a rapid fire does a good job, a good enough job. The only times when I want a patch on my rapid fire is when I know I need to project coverage out. Like 
uh, we were flying in one location and it was a long field, just a long empty field with a road on either side. And at the end of the field, there were some trees that I wanted to play with. At that point, I wanted a patch antenna. I might have wanted two patch antennas, but I didn't have them with me. For most of the flying I do, uh, two Omnis gives me more than enough range. Now, bear in mind, I'm a freestyle pilot more, more than a racer. I'm typically flying by myself or with two or three other guys. We're all at 800 milliwatts. So um, so even when I'm in a bando or something, I'm still... Uh, but even if I was like at a, a, a bando or something and I'm standing here and the building is there, you might think, well, why not put a patch on there and get the extra coverage? The Omnis do a good enough job. And, you know, why be swapping antennas if I don't need to? So... Uh, if you do not have a rapid fire, if you have a traditional diversity module, even a high performance one like an OWL RC, for traditional diversity modules, I think you always want to patch in an Omni. They do not do the best with, I've done a couple tests where I've tested a traditional diversity module with two Omnis. It always does worse than if it has two patches. So, but if you have a rapid fire, I use two Omnis as my all around. I actually was just looking at Oh, yeah, I actually was just looking at this video, literally five minutes before the live stream, looking at this video from Mute FPV. Mute FPV is uh, it's a pretty oh, great great. YouTube channel. He, he does not talk over his videos, so if he's the kind of the opposite of me. All his videos are just like music and stills, and, uh, and, and he actually did a test where he compared... Uh, two Omnis versus Omni and Patch with Rapid Fire. But here's what I noticed. He used one Batch 1 and one Batch 2 Rapid Fire. And I just wanted to double check this with Mr. Tony Cake from Immersion RC. Uh, Rapid Fire Batch 2 is about 3 dB more sensitive than Rapid Fire Batch 1. I was actually just typing a... I was just wanted to make sure I had my facts right before I pointed this out. Rapid Fire Batch 2 is about 3 dB more sensitive than Batch 1. So if you're going to do a head-to-head -head comparison, you got to use two Batch 2s or two Batch 1s. And, and, by the way, Batch 3 got even more sensitive. Yeah. So Rapid Fire just keeps getting better. Let me just ping off this comment. There we go. Now, now I'm the asshole. Um, <laughs> I do like his testing a lot, but uh, you gotta, you gotta. Uh, some people who are who hear that rapid fire got more sensitive are annoyed. Like people who bought batch one are like, "Hey, how could you make it more sensitive for batch two? And then batch three is coming out, and hey, it got even more sensitive." And it's like, well, what should he? Should they stop making it better? I mean, batch one is still pretty freaking good. But if you got batch two, it has a little bit more inherent sensitivity, and batch three is even better after that. So there you go. Okay, let's keep going. A couple guesses here in the Discord about what is happening with fat, with uh, with goggles in a few days. Some people guessing budget fat sharks some people guessing that it, here are the common guesses and i'm not saying that they're right or wrong some of the common guesses are a new budget fat shark a new high-end fat shark that orca will finally announce that they're going into production some common guesses couldn't say tony briz wants to know why two omnis would be better tony briz here's the thing um rapid fire is doing signal combining so rapid fire will do best when it has two like equal signals. Now, as long as the signals are sufficiently strong to be uncorrupted, it doesn't really matter. The reason that the two omni two omnis are not necessarily better, but two omnis are good enough and they're less hassle because when you have a patch, let's say you have a patch and you're flying like 360 around yourself. Well, when you go behind yourself, you get a significant reduction in range. So the idea with two Omnis on a rapid fire is it's a lazy approach. Imagine that I've got a 10 dB patch and an Omni, and then I'm flying. 
and my head goes like this. Because it does, right? Well, now my patch is pointed down at the ground. Oops. And now Rapid Fire is like, hey, where, where, where? I need two signals. I can't do my job here. So the idea with two Omnis is it's just like, forget it. Just, it's omnidirectional. Um, drop my head, doesn't matter. Flying behind myself, doesn't matter. Turn my head, doesn't matter. So the Omnis, if you knew for a fact that you were always going to be flying in that direction and you were not going to drop your head or anything like that, then Rapid Fire would be better with two patches. But since we don't know these things, especially because we're wearing goggles on our head and our head moves around, just use two Omnis and it's good enough most of the time. That's the thinking, Tony. Oleg K wants to know, what's my personal preference for 4S 5-inch? 2207, 2700 KV from RCX or 3B Hobby, 2306, 2500 KV? Personally, Oleg, I prefer a 2207 to a 2306 motor, all else being equal. The RCX motor is 2700 KV, which is a little higher KV. It's going to limit your prop selection and it's going to hurt your battery a little. I would really, but I think 3B Hobby is a little bit better brand than than RCX. So I would take a 3B Hobby 2207, 2500 KV. That would be my pick. But between those two, I'd probably take the 3B Hobby. I think the 3B Hobby is just a little bit better brand. I think they're a little more expensive though. So, Brett wants to know a good frame with mounting holes for two stacks. Brett, the Armitan Marmot has a 20 millimeter mounting hole in the rear. Uh, didn't the, doesn't the TBS Source 1 or the Source 2 have that as well? Yeah, Source 1 DJ Pop points that out. Let's see here. Uh, Silphied X wants to know, I have the Lux F7, the Luminaire 50 amp ESC, the Xing 1800 KV 2207. Do you think 8S is a good or terrible idea? Well, let's see. Well, let's just assume that the Luminaire 50 amp ESC is rated for 8S. I don't think you'd be asking the question if you if it wasn't. So now let's let's do some math. I don't know why my shortcuts are reversed, but I'm glad I figured. It. Okay, so 1800 kV on 6s we know that works so what is the equivalent on 8s uh 6s sorry 6s 2150 works what about 8s 1800 so the way we're going to do this is we're going to take 8 over 6 and that's 1.333 we're then going to take 1800 multiply by 1.333 and that is 2300 so 8S 1800 KV is equivalent roughly to 6S 2400 KV. That's asking a lot, I think. Did I go the wrong way? 8S, yeah, no, it's going to be faster. 1800 KV, 6S. Yeah, I, I think that's, I mean, uh, you can do it, but yikes. To me, that feels excessive. If you told me you were going to run 6S 2400 KV with no like uh, no throttle limit or anything, I'd be like, Ugh. I mean, I was surprised. 6S 2150 kV on 5-inch pulled 3,100 watts, a lot. 150 amps on 6S, 3,100 watts. It's insane. Like, you're not going to be doing a lot of full throttle on 6S 2150 without killing your packs. So I'm not sure about that. I think that's iffy. <laughs> Let's see here. Elevated Customs wants to know my thoughts on UAV Tech's video about boosting D gains in beta flight. Elevated Customs, I haven't seen that exact video, but listen, whatever Mark Spatz says, UAV Tech is his channel, whatever he says about PID tuning in beta flight, I probably agree. He's kind of on the forefront here. Um, so if he said something and I was like, that's not right. The very first thing I would do is go ask him. And I would not be like, no, he's wrong. I would really hesitate to do that. So El, whatever, what are my thoughts on UAV Tech's thoughts on PID tuning? I agree. <laughs> Let's see here. Mm. Oh, wow. We got a lot of chats from the uh, 
from the Discord. Let's try and catch up real quick. Is this a terrible idea? Is it a terrible idea? What is what a terrible? What are you doing here? You gotta, what are you, you soldering? Is that your ground? Why are you putting your ground on your SMA connector? What are you doing? What are you doing, man? Connector ripped off in a crash. Oh, it seems to be working. Okay. It's a weird idea, Cyclops, but I guess you got to do what you got to do. Scott wants to know if I can make a Tyrannus QX7 setup. Listen, Scott, here's the thing. Here's the good news about, about Tyrannus. All OpenTX radios are basically the same software. They just have a slightly different, like, like the QX7, the screen size is a little different. So sometimes you go into the menu, whereas on a, like an X9D, it's all on one screen. But the basic setup instructions are the same, Scott. What I would suggest is that you watch my Learn to Build This Quadcopter series. Um, and it's it, the, the thing is, you skip the part where I build the quadcopter because you're not building the same quad. But then when you get to video like 9 or 10, it's where I start setting up the transmitter. Watch those videos. And although I'm using a Tyrannus X9D, everything I do is exactly the same on your QX7. It's just like you have a scroll wheel and I have an up-down button, right? But everything I do is the same stuff you need to do with your QX7. So that's what I would suggest. Learn to build this quadcopter. All right, guys, I got to, how do you tell, Chamber wants to know, how do you tell what batch your rapid fire is? That's a tougher one. I, I'm not sure exactly how you would tell that. They may have a hardware revision in the about screen. I don't know the answer to that. I don't think batch three has started shipping yet. Batch two, if you bought, if you bought when it first came out, you got batch one. If you bought anytime in the last few months, you're probably batch two. All right, I got to get back to the, this is too long. I got to get back. We got super chats stacking up, but I got to take a minute and get back to the regular YouTube chat. I don't like to spend too long fawning over the people who actually pay my bills because it makes me feel bad. It makes me feel bad. In fact, sometimes sometimes I feel like I, I, I spend less attention on my patrons uh, because I don't want anybody to accuse me I hate it when people accuse me of like only – I started answering questions for free and for the longest time I didn't have a Patreon at all. And people said – I just liked talking to people and talking about drones and feeling useful and I still do. And people said you should start a Patreon and I was like, I don't know. Who would pay for this? Well, it turns out they were right. But every so often I'm just like – I don't want anybody to accuse me of only – anyway. I'm sorry. I should talk to my therapist, not to you guys. Back here we go. What one of my thoughts on the Runcam run Phoenix camera by Oscar Leong? Uh, I've looked at the Runcam Phoenix. I looked at it in a previous live stream. You can check that out. I'll put a link up here. Oscar Leong Runcam Phoenix. Oscar Leong's Runcam Phoenix. Basically, this is a new camera that Oscar Leong has worked with Runcam to tune and market, and it's pretty decent. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of the Eagle, but the Eagle is super expensive. The Phoenix comes in a little cheaper and has pretty decent image quality. Looks like it doesn't here. We'll put we'll put a little a little screen up here. This is Oscar's video about the run cam Phoenix. No, no audio, please. Um, that doesn't look bad. That doesn't look bad. Doesn't have a lot of that shimmer that people hate about the uh, Eagle. Looks like it's got decent dynamic range here in the shadows. Looks pretty good. Honestly, yeah, I like it. I mean, I haven't tested it thoroughly, but overall, not bad. That's uh, and and here's the thing: when you see these branded cameras, right? Uh, like the Oscar, I hope that Oscar is getting a couple bucks every time you buy one. So, by buying some of these people, some of the people say, "Oh, you just put your name on a product, and then you expect us to give you money." It's like, well, you know, it's it's a way that you can you can support people by joining their Patreon. You can support them by donating on PayPal, or you can support them by buying their branded products. And it's just a way to throw a couple bucks at them and get a camera. Let's see here. What do you think about Wiccan FPV wants to know what I think about the two marmot frames is the old carbon flying as good as the space carbon I actually so you may have heard I broke my marmot frame a little while back don't freak out I did not crash it into a pile of pillows 
<laughs> I crashed it. I overcorrected uh, after making, I did a big acro move where I was looking at the sky. And when I finally finished the power loop, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm way too close to these trees. <laughs> Cause like there's this, there's this point where you're up in the sky and you're like, I kind of want to look down and see where I'm at, but you don't want to break the flow of the move. So you're just like, I'm just going to keep pitching back smoothly and hope. And when I finished the move, I was way too close to, and I overcorrected, I throttled up and I throttled up right into the ground and broke my frame. So, um, I, I did get a spare under warranty and I got the standard carbon, not the space grade carbon. I want to try it out. I do think the space grade carbon, I, my gut feeling is that it's not as strong, but I can't say for sure. And I want to try it. So, but I haven't, uh. I haven't, uh, I haven't installed it yet. I haven't actually gotten around to that. So I don't know the answer. Can a bad FC cause one motor to not spin or spaz out? Asks Twisted FPV. Um, so if a bad FC causing the motor not spin would be the signal wire. So an easy way to test that Twisted FPV is to swap two signal wires. You got a motor number three is twitching. Motor number two is not twitching. Swap the signal wires. If you solder the signal wires to the FC, it's a piece of cake to swap them. If you have a four-in-one, it's a little trickier. You can remove the wires from the plug by using a tiny little razor knife or razor blade or a pin to lift the retaining tab. You can slide out the wires, swap them, slide them back in again, plug it in, and see if the same motor twitches or if the, you know if you move the signal wires. By the way, don't try to fly that way. It'll flip out. Use the motors tab. But it's just basic process of elimination there. By swapping the signal wires, you now, the ESC and the motor are the same. The only thing that's changed is the signal output on the FC. And you can see if, if that's the problem. Best way to remove stripped screws, asks Slagged FPV. Best way to remove stripped screws, Slagged FPV, is a tool called an Easy Out or Screw Extractor. An easy out is, now there's various, easy out I think is probably a brand name, but to look for a screw extractor, I just searched for easy out. Um, and basically it is a drill bit that is designed to bite into and grab the screw and then back it out. That's the best way. That's, I mean, it's not cheap. It's 35 bucks for a set. I don't know if you do a lot of machine work, then, uh, you're going to, uh, you're going to use them a lot, but Steve Maslich, you have a, Steve had a question, uh, that he asked way back at the beginning of the stream. He said, I wanted to get my question in before I start driving. Now Steve's listening to the stream while he drives. Hi, Steve. Uh, I'll get your question. I almost overlooked it, Steve. Steve wants to know any insight on the stingy hype train motors. Uh, Steve has the stingy hype train motors on his quad and needs replacements. I don't know the answer to that. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask somebody. I'm going to ask somebody. I'm not going to put, I'm not going to put him on the spot by putting him on the stream, but I am going to ask Steve, uh, uh, somebody what the status is there. And depending on what the answer comes back, I may, I may put it on the stream or I may completely forget that we've had this interaction and never think of it again. That, that does happen sometimes. Remind me if I, uh, if I forget, but I'll go ahead and ask. Yeah. If you've got a screw that's stuck, if you've got a screw that's stripped, sometimes you can take a Dremel with a little cutting bit, a carbon fiber cutting bit. It's not carbon fiber. You know what I mean? The little thin abrasive discs and you can cut a flathead into it. If you have completely ripped off the tip, an, e uh, an easy out is really the only way to do it. Noisy B says Banggood has the 2150 KV hype train. Noisy B, is that the stingy or the, or the oh my God though? Red Axis wants to know if the Lumineer Diversity Antenna Pack is a good upgrade for the Tiny Hawk RTF kit goggles. Yeah, Red Axis, that would be a great upgrade. Uh, those are good antennas and upgraded antennas are one of the simplest things you can do to improve the performance of your cheap ass FPV goggles. Uh, the cheap antennas that come with them are not great. Um, it may not be a night and day difference, but it certainly will be an improvement. Uh, Steve Maslick, Noisy B says that they have the stingies on Banggood. Um, that, are you sure? 
Does Banggood carry the hype trains? Holy crap. Well, I'm I did not know Banggood. Wow. Wow. How did Hype Train Motors get on Banggood? I don't know, but they Oh wait, no 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 no. But look, in stock alert. They they're not in stock. They're not in stock. So never mind. Okay. Uh Chandler Woodruff. Chandler Woodruff says, "Yeah, plus one for trying to cut a slit into the screw top." to try to get a flathead screwdriver, get it out. Mike J wants to know about the TBS Aram Polar X. So this is, I'm very happy you brought that up. The Aram Polar X, uh, this it, oh, I'm, there we go. Uh, the Aram Polar X is a new antenna from TBS. It has gotten a lot of uh, attention. <laughs> Some people saying this makes no freaking sense. This is dumb. Other people saying it's really awesome. And I'll have you know that I sent this week, I mailed uh, a, a couple of Aram Polar antennas to Alex Grieve. I'd be crazy because uh, Alex and I have been having a conversation. Hang on. Let me make sure it's, I'll show you the conversation if it's, sanitary <laughs> i don't want to i don't want to put him on the spot but hang on we've been having a conversation here, here i'll show you this little excerpt from the conversation where we're like we're like i i'm so confused What's happening with this Aram Polar? And he's like, I don't know. It sounds like BS. And I'm like, is this even possible? And he's like, no, it's not possible. <laughs> so I bought a couple of these antennas and I sent them to him and we're going to test them. Because here's the thing. Although I feel like a good scientist, a good engineer, you when you hear something and your brain goes, this is total baloney. You don't just assume that you're right. You're like, okay, let's test it. Now, there's a limit. When you show me a perpetual motion machine, and I go, that's, sorry, I'm not going to waste my energy trying to figure out if you're violating the laws of thermodynamics. Good for you. No. But, hey, let's, who knows what they're on to. Let's test it. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, he's going to test one of these antennas on his super duper test machine, and we're going to see. What it does, that is coming on my channel soon, eventually. I send them to him this week. We'll see what's happening. Let's see here. All righty. DJ Pop, you got a uh, DJ Pop Elevated Customs in the Discord is helping DJ Pop with... Uh, with some black box analysis. I'm probably not going to dive into that here on the stream. B42 now says, Hey, Joshua Bardwell, I have the same problem you describe in the real world troubleshoot. All motors have electrical contact with the frame. Well, B42 now, it's normal for the motor base and the motor screws to have electrical contact with the frame. Just the motor windings should not have electrical contact with the frame. So when you say all motors have electrical contact with the frame, I need to know exactly what part of the motors you're talking about. Okay. Oh, my God. We got super chats coming in. Okay. Let me get the super chats here. Twisted FPV, thank you for the $3 donation and the fist bump emoji. JTFPV, five bucks. Hey, JB, I just started FPV about two months ago with 4S LiPo. Should I continue with 4S or jump to 6S? JTFPV, here's what I say about that. 6S does have a performance advantage, but it is, it's, the difference in feel is big. But as of the different, but 4S is completely doable. And fi you have to look at the price difference. So if I fly 6S, I prefer the 6S 1250 milliamp hour batteries. On 4S, I prefer a 4S 1500. Um, I, I, that's just where I like to be. And the, the 1250 batteries are like 28, 30 bucks. The 4S batteries, 
you can when you, if you find a good sale you can get decent quality 4s 1500s for 17 18 bucks maybe if you're buying them not on sale 22 bucks so there is a price difference mostly in the batteries if you go apples for apples with watt hours you would buy 10 50 milliamp hour 6s to me i prefer the 1250s don't let's not go into the debate about oh but those are bigger batteries why aren't you flying 4s 1800s I'm working on that. But if I if you were to buy 6S 1050s, I think your experience would be a lot closer to 4S. Not so much a difference in flight time, more a difference in flight feel. So it's just a question of where you are in your budget. I don't think it's a slam dunk, especially for a beginner, that you need to go to 6S. If you have a lot of money and you want to fly 6S, you can. The big difference, I think, is that the batteries are more expensive. Wolf FPV, thanks for five bucks. I bought two flight controllers that are showing odd voltages. <laughs> Pardon me. I have to sneeze. I got something on my nose. Sorry. I got two flight controllers that are showing odd voltages in beta flight. On 4S, I got 16.72 volts on the plus minus pads and 11 volts inside of beta flight. 6S is 22.8 and 15.7. Wolf FPV, anytime, you, so you're doing the right thing. Anytime your OSD voltage shows a weird number, check with a multimeter. Check with a multimeter right there on the pads on the flight controller and see if the voltage is the same. Go, go to the power and battery tab and adjust the VBAT scale, the battery voltage scale, um, and that can help get the number correct. But here's the thing, Wolf FPV, almost all Betaflight flight controllers are designed to have a VBAT scale of about 110. Mm. Excuse me. Um, sometimes you have to adjust it to 111 or 109, but if you have to adjust your VBAT scale to like some crazy number, like way different than 110, probably the board is just damaged. You can try adjusting the VBAT scale Wolf FPV in the power and battery tab to try and get those numbers correct. <laughs> PK Stefan wants to know, for, thank you for five bucks, PK Stefan. W thank you, Joshua, for the great content. Why would FreeSky enable D16 with a firmware update and not D8 as well? What am I missing? PK Stefan, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I'm not sure. If you think about receivers that are out there, um, well, it's not the receivers, it's the module. Uh, PK, I don't know if there's... So, hold on, sorry. Uh, now I'm just flustered. What what PK is talking about is the Tyrannus X9 Lite radio. Uh, it came. It's a new FreeSky radio. came out with the new access protocol. Did not support the older D16 receivers and did not support the D16 protocol. And after a lot of backlash, FreeSky... To their credit, they acquiesced and they've released a firmware now that you can flash to the X9 Lite that will add the D16 support. Why didn't they add D8 support? I don't know the answer to that, PK, whether there's a hardware reason they didn't do it or whether it's a business decision. I can't answer the question as to why they didn't do it. I wouldn't assume that it's just a business decision, though. Like, maybe there's a – like, the, the receiver module is controlled by a microcontroller, like a like an F4 or an F1 or an F3 or, or a PIC or whatever it is. Um, it has only so much memory. Maybe there wasn't enough memory to hold the access protocol and D16 and D8. Maybe it's, it's just a, a question of code space. Uh, I don't think we'll ever know the real reason. But I wouldn't assume that it's just malice on Freescape's part. Alrighty, we're caught. Oh, we're caught up. We're caught up on the super chats. Thank you. Half half. Thank you for one hundred Norwegian kroners. Uh, says my my video has helped twice this weekend. No, no specific question. Thank you. Nick Barabe wants to know. I bought the FlySky radio and I'm having trouble finding FlySky compatible micro whoops, tiny whoops. Do I settle for an old model or get a new one and replace the TX? Nick, this is one of the challenges with buying a FlySky radio, uh, and that's true whether you're buying the budget FlySky IA6 whatever that comes with like just the $60 radio or whether you buy a $300 radio or whatever the, uh, the, the Nirvana goes for. Uh, expensive or cheap, when you buy a FlySky radio, you are a little bit limited in what bind and fly, ready-to-fly quads you'll have available. I'm 99% sure Beta FPV makes... FlySky compatible, uh, whoops, uh, let's just check this. 
RX version. Yeah. So the place, if you have an oddball transmitter, like, well, oddball, if you if you don't have a FreeSky transmitter, Beta FPV is the place to go. You can see they'll even sell you a Futaba receiver. Go figure. So uh, that's where I would suggest you go. Um, Charlie Essex points out you can put a FreeSky module in the FlySky uh, transmitter depends on the transmitter, but um, FreeSky XJT module. If your transmitter has a JR bay, you can get. A, you should consider getting the jumper module. The jumper module is forty bucks, and it does all the protocols: FreeSky, FlySky, you name it. You're going to need to be running OpenTX though to use the jumper module. You can't do that if you have like a. Um, well, I don't know. You need to be running OpenTX, but you can also just get this XJT module. It'll go in your JR bay and it will allow you to bind with. Why am I clicking and nothing's happening? Click. Alrighty. So much for that. Uh, <laughs> you can get this XJT module that'll let you bind to FreeSky, uh, FreeSky bind of flies. Andre Zernick wants to know if I've seen the Tiny Hawk S and will I review it? I do have the Tiny Hawk S. It's a new 2S Tiny Hawk and I would, I, I would like to review it. They did send it to me. Um, I hate. I hate it. E Emacs is smart. Emacs sends these quads out a month in advance. They have an embargo date. And then on the date of the embargo, everyone releases their review video about it. And I don't... I just hate it. I hate this idea. I hate... I don't know. Just like... I just, I would wait, to, if there's if an embargo on us, I would wait two weeks, even though it's like, it, it's bad for, it's bad for sales. It's bad for my affiliate numbers. I would make more money if I jumped on the hype train and reviewed it the day of the embargo. But I look on YouTube and 17 people have this video reviewing the exact same quad. And I'm just like, no, screw, I don't forget it. I'm not doing it. I don't, I'm going to, I'm going to make a video about beta flight and what the D-derm does. I'm going to make the most obscure freaking video just to prove I don't work for you. <laughs> I don't know. So I, I, w I will probably review it. It's a good. I mean, I like the Tiny Hawk. I like the 1S Tiny Hawk. It's pretty decent, especially with the Project Mockingbird tune. Emacs makes great, uh, great quads. But when I get a package, I up in the mail and they say, you know, we sent this to 27 other reviewers and there's an embargo date and your video is going to be competing with 27 other people for attention. I'm just like, forget it. I don't want to be a part of a cattle call. I'd rather get nothing than be a part of a cattle call. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't like feeling like I'm part of a hype train. I don't like feeling like I'm part of a marketing. If somebody wants me to cover a yeah, let me tell you this, vendors out there. If you want me to cover your product on a specific day, the way to do it is to say we're only sending this to you and we're giving you a a, a lead and no one else has gotten it. And I'll be like, oh, you remember when I did the review, the, the video about the Popo motors? I did a review the first, when Get FPV first released the Popo shaft. Me and Paul Nurkula were the only two people who got the pre-release and made a video about it. And they said, save the video until such and such a date. And I was like, oh, yeah, I got an exclusive. <laughs> and I did a video. I did a, I, I, I was honest in my video, but it came out on the exact date that they said the embargo was lifted. But the Emacs one where there's like 12 different, 18 different people reviewing the same one. And I look at my YouTube uh, suggested videos and there's like 17 videos all about the same quad. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to be a part of that. I need you to make me feel special. I need to feel like I'm. <laughs> what are my thoughts on the Free Sky X9 Lite? Asks Felix X. Felix S. Free Sky X9 Lite. If you like the uh, wait, the X9 Lite. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Wrong radio. Hold on. Here's the thing about the X9 Lite. How much is it? No, 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 no. I need a price. This is not going to give me a price. Where's the price? X9 Lite. Where do I buy it? Awful, awful. X9 Lite. 90 bucks. Okay. X9 Lite is 90 bucks and supports access protocol. Hang on. Can't type these words today. Free Sky QX7 is 100 bucks. Which is better? Mm. I, 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 I guess the, I guess this one's okay for ten bucks less. Yeah, I would probably take this. It has. Does it have fewer? I think it has fewer switches and potentiometers. It takes eighteen six fifty cells in the back. That's nice. All right, let's see if we can find a back view. It has the newest, like here in the bottom, it's got easy plugs and stuff. Decent build. I don't know which has better build quality, the QX7 or this. Let's not forget the QX7, the base QX7 is not the, like the top of the line in terms of the gimbals and stuff. QX7 has, I think, a little bit larger gimbals. You can get the QX7 with uh, for like 160 bucks, 180 bucks. You can get a really upgraded QX7, but that's a different price range. I think for 90 bucks, this is pretty compelling. Like, when you're down in this price range, if you go much cheaper, you get just a really poor radio. Like, the base FlySky radio, it's okay, but it's you've given up a lot. This one's okay. For 90 bucks. I think it's tough to say which I would pick, the QX7 or the X9 Lite. I mean, the QX7 doesn't support access. If you want access support, then you're going to be going with the X9 Lite. So you have to decide for yourself how compelling you think the access protocol is. Jim Bubba wants to know, I have $650 saved up. Should I buy HDOs now or wait for the Orcas? That's a really tough question, Jim Bubba. Here's the question about the Orcas. Let me talk about Orca for a minute. One of my concerns when Orca announced a Kickstarter was that people would lose their money. The Kickstarter policy does not require Kickstarter to give you your money back. If they reach their funding goal, they can theoretically take your money and just not then to be like, ah, we weren't able to deliver and then just go out of business. But Orca has said that if they do not reach their funding goal, I mean, they've said that if they take the money and don't deliver a product, they'll give the money back. And I, uh, some people have said, why did Orca go with Kickstarter? Uh, and they wondered whether Orca was out of money. Orca has stated that they got VC funding uh, a couple months ago. And that this is a public statement. They got VC funding a, month, a couple months ago and they have about a year of burn rate. So Orca is not doing a Kickstarter because they're out of money. I think they're just doing a Kickstarter because they want to gauge demand and everybody says, oh, I want this product. But then when it's time to put your money down, you find out how much people really want. And number two, like why should they spend their VC money if they could get you guys to buy into a pre-order and have a little bit more money? So um, I think Orca has money and I think there's a very good chance they'll deliver a product. Now, here's the question. How long will that take? And this is, if you talk to people who participate in Kickstarters a lot, one of the things there that they say is sometimes the vendor just doesn't deliver. That's probably not going to happen with Orca, in my opinion. Sometimes the vendor under delivers on their promises. So you get a product, but it's not as good as you thought it was going to be. I think Orca is going to deliver a product that is... I mean, I've seen the images, the, the screens they've got. It looks amazing. I think that their history in, in sort of industrial design and, and manufacturing means they'll probably deliver a decent product. Will you be happy that you spend 500, 600, whatever dollars on it? That's a tougher question. Like when you look at the final Orca goggle and you go, I could have bought an HDO for 500 bucks. Will you th think that that was a good trade? 
That's a tougher question, but I, maybe, maybe. Let's call that neither here nor there. The other th question that is remains to be seen is when will they deliver a product? And if you look at what Orca has done between January and CES, when I went out to visit them and I saw their prototype, and then just last month, the Rotorite guys went out to Croatia and saw what they had. If you look at how much has been done between in the uh, January, February, March, April, May, four to five months, how long will it take before they have a final goggle? Uh, I think you might, if you decide to buy into the Orca, wish that you had gotten something. I don't know. That's the big. That's the biggest risk with Orca right now, in my humble opinion, is that it'll they'll be they're trying to get the details right for so long that by the time you get the goggle, you'll be like, "Wow, that was a while." So. Craft King wants to know, is Rotoriot being purchased by Red Cat? Rotoriot, uh, Red Cat released a letter of intent to purchase Rotoriot. Um, I don't really know any of the details about these kinds of things, but as I understand it, when you're... So Red Cat is a publicly traded company, and as I understand it, when you're a publicly traded company, there are some obligations to shareholders. You can't just, like just buy another company you have to like make a public announcement so your shareholders are no, i don't know so i red cat has this letter of intent that they made a press release saying that they intended to buy rotor riot that's really all i know uh that's the same thing you know from having read the letter of intent um that they that means that like R Red Cat and Rotor Riot have talked about it and you know, would like to buy each other or be bought, but the I don't think that I don't think it means the money has actually changed hands yet or anything. That's all I know, though. Does Red Cat still exist? Yeah, Red Cat still exists. Re this is Red Cat propware, not not Red Cat, the crappy RC car manufacturer. Let me catch up on a couple super chats here. Filberto Castro, thank you for 10 bucks, says, when enabled air mode and then armed, it launches itself in the air. When I deactivate air mode, it doesn't do that. Um, I even lowered the motor idle to 1.5. There's no difference. So first of all, Filberto, do not lower the motor idle below about 2.5%. That's very, very risky. Uh, the quad can just fall out of the air. If the quad is taking off and flying to the moon, then the issue is, insufficient filtering or excessive degain. Now you may say, well, I turn on air mode and it flies to the moon, but I turn off air mode and it's fine. Air mode is not causing the problem. Air mode is allowing the problem to happen. Air mode increases authority at low throttle. So this problem, you've got this, like the PIDs are kind of just bubbling. And when you turn air mode on, they bubble over and the quad flies away. But the fundamental problem still exists. What I like to say is, that's like saying, oh, I hurt my ankle. Uh, as long as I don't try to walk too fast, that's okay. But as soon as I try to run, then it hurts. Right, but the problem is that you hurt your ankle. The problem is not that air mode is on or off. Air mode is not causing the problem. It is allowing the problem to happen. But air mode should be able to be on. So what you need to do, Filberto, is lower degain if you've turned degain up or adjust your filters in the filter tab so that the filters have a lower cutoff, more tuning or more filtering. And that will cause the problem. Also, always whenever you have problems with, with noise, always inspect the quad physically to see if there's any physical damage like a broken standoff or anything that would cause excess vibration. Zero FPV, thank you for five euros. No question. Bobby Brooks, thank you for five bucks. I can't get Smart Audio to work on my new build. Kakute F7 and Mach 2 VTX with Betaflight 4.0. Um, so Bobby Brooks, the place we need to go with this is to look at your wiring. The Mach 2 VTX audio pad needs to be wired to a TX pad on the Kakute F7. TX, so it'll be TX3, TX4, whatever TX you are that you want to use. Um, on the Kakute F7, I'm pretty sure that the wiring... The, the VTX gets wired in the upper left of the board, and there's a UART like 6, I think, is right next to there, which would be a good one to use. Then in the ports tab, go down to the peripherals column and enable the S smart audio VTX peripheral. 
uh, on U the UART that you connected to the TX pad. That's it, Bobby. After that, it should be working. You can check it by going into the OSD, go Features, VTX, SA, and then in there, if you see just a bunch of dashes and the word Statix, it's not working. But if you see the full Smart Audio menu, it is working. Broken Slider, thanks for four Canadian dollars, no question. Giroud FPV, what, Giroud FPV always gives me 99 cents then two or three times so thank you for two dollars i'm not sure what this i mean kind of keep the transactions under a dollar so his mom doesn't notice i don't know <laughs> pavel zet thank you for five pounds thank you for the knowledge you're passing on no question thank you pavel and we are caught up we're caught up let's check the discord going back to the discord how are we doing, Discord? What have we got here? The Discord, I always get lost on the Discord during my live streams because the di people in the Discord are just chilling out, talking to each other, and it makes the questions not jump out at me. Everybody, that's one of the great, I have to say, that's one of the great things about my Discord, not to, not to toot my own horn, but to toot the horn of the guys in my Discord who are so freaking helpful. I get on the Discord two or three times a day. I, I hate to say this, but I seldom just kind of like, ah, just hang out in the chat. I, I'm always so freaking busy that I like, I just, I'm like emails, Facebook messages, Patreon messages, uh, Google, Google Hangout messages, Skype messages, uh, Discord messages. And then I'm just like constantly doing a loop. So I check the Discord two or three times a day and half the time, by the time I show up, a bunch of questions have already been answered by the amazing people in the Discord. In fact, I've got a couple of uh, people I've tagged as know-it-alls. These people have been tagged uh, as particularly helpful. Uh, just wait for people who are answering questions, who consistently answer questions and help, and then I just whoop, right-click, tag them. Sorry, Elevated Customs, I didn't mean to tease you. I just noticed you here. Um, so they're awesome. What do we got? See, look, Elevated Customs right here. You're, you're in danger of being tagged as a know-it-all, Elevated Customs. Look at you being super helpful. You're, 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 you're dangerously close to being tagged as a know-it-all. <laughs> oh tumbleweed 30 points out youtube premium lets you send two super chats for free at a buck a piece that's why multiple one dollar chats from a member interesting so if you have i didn't know this but if you have youtube premium and by the way youtube premium a little commercial for youtube premium i watch do you watch a lot of youtube i do i do you hate commercials i do youtube premium um i subbed it a while back because I just hate freaking commercials. It costs, how much does it cost? How much does it cost? It's not that much. How much is it? Just please tell me the price. For real? Oh, it's because it knows I'm logged in. It knows I already have it. Please just tell me the price. One month, 17, oh, 17, 20 bucks a month is not nothing. So, so it's 20 bucks a month for a family and you can have up to six family members. So if you have a bunch of family members, you just add them all to the plan and then none of you have to see commercials ever again. And um, when, you when you're when you a member of YouTube Premium and you watch videos, the YouTuber gets a gets a percentage of your of your pr of your monthly subscription based on how many of their videos you watch. So you don't see commercials, but you still support the YouTubers you want. And apparently, I didn't know this, you can actually send super chats for free. So if you're a YouTube premium member, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Gibbsy FPV wants to know, how can I fix small nose dips on throttle punches? So Gibbsy FPV, if you, uh, so Betaflight 4.0 is better at this than any version of Betaflight before it. Betaflight has always struggled with this issue of keeping the nose steady when the throttle changes position. And I'm looking, I don't have a quadcopter here. The reason that this is such a big problem is, in my opinion, it has to do with the aerodynamic status of the quad. Think about when the quad is flying forward. The front motors are getting clean air. The front motors are churning up the air into a bunch of turbulence. And the rear motors, they're getting some clean air coming in from here, right? But f they're also getting a bunch of turbulent, dirty air from the, from the front motors. And the relative ratio of that is different depending on your throttle position. So as you change throttle position, the front motors kind of, as you raise throttle, the front motors kind of speed up and thrust more than the rear motors. 
and the rear motors get more turbulent air and lose thrust. And that, in my opinion, is why when you throttle up rapidly, the quad tends to pitch back, and when you drop throttle, the quad tends to pitch forward. If you, you can test this yourself, some people say, well, what about aerodynamic drag? What about uh, CG? And I don't think that's the issue because if you start from a dead flat hover and punch out, the quad will, will punch straight up. And if drag or CG were the issue, that wouldn't be the case, And I think. You could, we could argue about this, but let's not. Let's just assume I'm right. <laughs> so regardless of the reason, what, what you'll notice is that when you rapidly change the throttle position, the quad will tend to pitch back or forward. Betaflight has always struggled with this. Um, Anti-gravity is one of the features that is supposed to fix this. Anti-gravity boosts the I-term when the throttle moves rapidly. And I, 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 I like to point out when we talk every so often, I like to point out that I suggested this feature to Boris B years ago. And uh, it's tough because like maybe somebody else out there had already thought of it. I don't want to claim that I was like the sole source, but I will say that years ago, I suggested this feature to Boris B. And then he said, hey, I, we implemented it. Do you want to try it out? And I, this is one of the features of Betaflight that I kind of feel like I, if not exactly invented, I mean, obviously I didn't code it, but I like was part of the, I take credit for that. I will, I'll tell you the other one. The other feature of Betaflight that I am pretty sure that I suggested is TPA reduces the P and the D gain throttle PID attenuation, but TPA used to reduce the P, the I, and the D. And the problem was that when you went to high throttle, the quad would get very loose because the I gain was getting chopped. And I said to Boris, we should, we should only reduce the P and the D gain. The I gain should stay high at high throttle. And that got implemented. And again, I'm not saying I'm the only one or the first one to think of that, but I did think of it and then I suggested it and then it happened. So, how do you fix? Get back to the question. How do you fix? How do you fix this nose issue? But go to Betaflight 4.0. It's better than anything before. And then number two, anti gravity gain is the way to fix it. And then number three, if you cannot fix it, it may be that you have a bad motor or ESC. If you start from a flat punch and you jam the throttle and the quad goes, Bleh! it dips an arm, that, that ESC or motor may have an issue. Okay. Can we use servos? Ben Churn wants to know, can we use servos to tilt the FPV camera in Betaflight? Yes, it can be done, Ben. However, it's an enormous pain in the ass to get servos working with Betaflight. Many flight controllers don't break out the servo outputs. So when you enable the servo tilt feature, then you got to figure out where to wire the servo signal connectors. And it's a, it's a huge pain in the ass. Um, the best flight controllers I know of for doing servos in Betaflight are the Maytech flight controllers. Maytech, the Maytech flight controllers, a lot of them have iNav support, and iNav is very focused on servos because iNav deals a lot with fixed wings and stuff. Betaflight is more focused on multi rotors. The Maytech flight controllers will usually have documentation about how to wire up servos. The um, the SP Racing. Dominic Clifton's flight controllers also are focused on servos and wings. For an, your average Betaflight flight controller, in order to get servos working, you're going to need to do some resource remapping of the servo outputs, and you may run into timer issues, and it's a it's a kind of a crapshoot if it's going to work. But it can be done. JB Edits says, I sent you my black box, but I forgot to get debug scaled. Should I do another flight with that CLI commander? It should be fine. If Yeah, JB Edits and everybody else, if you are going to do any kind of black box troubleshooting, please go to the CLI and type set debug mode equals gyro underscore scaled. Um, I don't have a flight controller plugged in right now to show it to you. Debug mode equals gyro underscore scaled. Um, because that will log the raw gyro data. And anytime you're having trouble with like hot motors or filters or vibration, that gyro data is essential. Skadoosh says, stick your hand out the car window flat and then turn your hand sideways. Interesting point, Skadoosh, but hold on. Here, this, now we're getting into the, 
The question, Skadoosh, is we're going back to the question of why the quad pitches back when you change throttle. The question is, will the air res- So hold on. Yes, a flat quad will be pushed back. What about when you have a, 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 a surface at an angle to the airstream? Okay. Will it create a net torque? That's the question. Nobody will dispute that if you have a, a quadcopter and it's angled to the airstream, there is a net downward thrust. That's a fact. But is there a net torque? See, what should happen if we're talking about aerodynamic drag is as you reduce throttle, the quad pops up. But the quad doesn't pop up. It pitches back. And that is a net torque. So what, what would, in order for it to be aerodynamic drag, we would have to have a situation where the quad was being pushed on more at the back than the front and more at high throttle than at low throttle. So let's imagine you had a quadcopter with a spoiler on it, which would be stupid. Although I will point out that one of Ladrib's very, very first quadcopters, when he was first getting into quads, did have a spoiler on it, just for fun, not for... Let's imagine you had a quadcopter with a spoiler on it. That spoiler is going to make more downward thrust at high speed than low speed. And therefore, when you throttle up, the rear of the quad will be pushed backward more than the front. And when you throttle down, the rear of the quad will come forward. But that's not how quadcopters are built. Quadcopters are almost always very symmetrical, aren't they? And because the quadcopter is symmetrical, the net thrust on each part of the quadcopter, front to back and side to side, is going to be about the same. So I believe that when that from an aerodynamic drag perspective, the quadcopter should tend to descend slightly when it speeds up and tend to ascend slightly when it throttles down when it slows down but here's the thing that doesn't happen either does it because when you throttle down you get less downward force but also you get less motor so the net effect is that it descends so i don't think you can tell me that aerodynamic drag causes a net torque skadoosh i love this topic yeah i love the I love this topic and I will talk about this topic for hours, but I don't know if that's the best way to spend the live stream. Kyle Strait wants to know, is higher voltage better for long range or cruising? Yeah, in general, you get higher voltage, lower KV, larger props. That will in general give you better range. Yes, Kyle, that's the answer. Adam Banks wants to know, I have Crossfire with a Micro V2 bound, but nothing in the receiver tab. I know I've got the protocol and channel map right. Please help. Adam Banks, the next thing I do in a situation like this is I ask you for a photo of your wiring because the next thing to do is to just double check that your wiring is correct, but there are so many different ways that your wiring could be wrong that simply, and, and here's the thing, you think you've got it wired right. So when I say, have you got it wired right? You go, yep, and then we move on. But that doesn't really prove anything because if you had it wired right, it might be working. So Adam, what I want you to do is email me a photo of the wiring of the Crossfire receiver, the flight controller, and the wiring in between them so I can personally look and go, the red wire goes from here to there, and I can double check your wiring. Email me a photo of your wiring, Adam Banks, joshuabardwell at gmail.com, and I'll double check it. Chamer, you're doing a great job in the chat, dude. Uh, I keep looking over at the Discord and saying, have any questions come up? And the only thing going on in the Discord is that uh, this dude, his name is, he goes by Chamer, but that's not his actual name, is helping this other guy solve a problem. What are the problem you're trying to solve? Set gyro to use equals first or second. You're trying to switch. DJ Pop has a flight controller with dual gyros. Um, and is trying to change gyros what's the issue don't 
Don't don't use no no no. What are you doing? I have no context here. You definitely want to be using the MPU six thousand gyro. You definitely want to use it the MPU. Why are you having him use the other gyro? Two gyros. The thing is on beta flight on beta flight doesn't support 32k anymore if you have a flight controller with mpu 6000 you should be using it in my opinion and i've jumped in in the middle of the conversation oh he thinks the gyro is bad i see yeah okay that makes sense okay fine good work chamber i'm going to tag you as a know-it-all you better watch it i see so that's what i get for jumping in, in the middle of conversation <laughs> JB Edits wants to know, when I look at my black box, there's a spike of noise at the very start. Is that normal? I have a spike or, yeah. Um, thing is, JB Edits, if there's just a little spike of noise at the very beginning, maybe that's something to do with your motors starting up or when your quad is touching the ground. If it's just temporary and doesn't happen when you're flying, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, spike at 170 and 290 hertz. Uh, that's interesting. JB Edits, I would want to be looking not, the thing about the beta flight FFT display is it is an aggregate of the whole flight. Whereas if you look at something like plasma tree or PID toolbox, you can look at the 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 uh, the noise profile relative to throttle position, and it, it's a little bit more useful for discerning mechanical problems versus uh, motor problems. Here's a tip for you guys: I do not have a. Hmm, I really, it's pointless to give this tip without an example. If you're using something like, let me let, let me do this. What's the most useful thing I can actually show you guys? Here's the most useful thing I can actually show you guys. This is a tool. There's a tool out there called PID Toolbox. If you are into black box tuning, you need this. It's. I was going to make a video about it, but Mark Spatz beat me to it. So I'm going to just link you to his video. This is a great, great tool for analyzing gyro data, PID response, and filters is what it's really good at. And one of the things it has is these, let me see if I can find an, I'll just steal a screen grab from Mark's video. Has he got a zoomed in one where he actually shows the, uh, here we go. These charts are so wonderful for troubleshooting gyro data. And let me, let me explain to you what you're seeing here. The color represents the intensity of the of the vibration at that frequency and throttle position. So this is called a waterfall chart. You may have seen one of these in another context if you're if you do spectrum analysis or any kind of lab work. What we've got here is throttle position on the x-axis, frequency on the y-axis, and color represents magnitude. So we can say that at a throttle position of 20% we have a lot of vibration around 200 hertz. But at a throttle position of 90%, we have a lot of vibration around 400 hertz. And the reason this is useful is because if you see noise that changes with throttle position, like this is a great example, that's your motors. Your motors are making that noise because the motors change speed with the throttle position. Whereas if, look right here, look at this little horizontal line right here. If you see noise that is a flat horizontal line, it means that the noise is the same frequency regardless of how fast the motors are spinning. Now, what could cause something to vibrate at uh, you know, 600 hertz regardless of the motor frequency? Think about a guitar string. A guitar string will oscillate, vibrate at a certain frequency no matter how hard you strum it. It'll have a different amplitude but the frequency is always the same so when you look when you look at pid toolbox and you see that you've got vibration at a fixed frequency a horizontal line that is frame resonance or something mechanical about the frame or the quad whereas when you see noise like this that goes up with throttle position that is the motor noise and it's a really great way to analyze this stuff so like uh yeah so go check this video out, UAV Tech, the PID Toolbox. If you're if if this if you're the kind of person who needs this, then you're already salivating, and I've done my job. <laughs> <clears throat> All 
a couple super chats coming in. Dexter Johnson, thank you for ten dollars. JB, I'm building my first seven inch long rig quad using the TBS Source One frame with the Radix F4 and the Diatone PDB. What's the best motors to get the longest flight time using 6S? Dexter Johnson, I first of all, I need to qualify my answer by telling you that I am not really like an expert on seven inch long range cruising. But what I would say is in general, to get longer flight times, you go to larger props, higher voltage, and lower KV. Now, you've already gone to larger props, and the props are going to primarily d decide – the prop size and the frame size is going to decide the quad's handling characteristics. So uh, a 3-inch quad is going to be like very nimble and and it's not as fast and have shorter flight times. A 5-inch quad is going to be more stable, less nimble, right? And a 7-inch quad is going to be sort of more stable and less nimble. So I think choosing prop size, you choose largely based on the flight characteristic you're going for, but also the flight time, because as you go to larger props, you get more efficiency and longer flight times, but less handling. So, so that's how I would pick a prop size, is by balancing the desire for agility versus flight time, basically. So you've already decided you're in the seven inch prop range. That's where you're at. Now you gotta pick the motor KV and the voltage. The voltage, 6S is the obvious choice. Would you be better to go with 8S, 10S, 12S? Maybe, but finding hardware that runs on 8S, 10S, 12S is a lot harder and more expensive. So 6S is the obvious choice, and then you're left with motor KV. Uh, I've seen people run 6S, 1900 KV, 7-inch, and actually I was amazed they weren't like just destroying their batteries because that's kind of a high RPM for 7 inches. But if your focus is on flight time and distance, then I would be lowering the KV down at least to like 1600 kV. If you think about it, 6S 1600 kV is on a five inch prop. That's about the same as 4S 23,400 kV. I haven't done the math. I think it's close, it's around 2350 kV. And that five inch 2300 kV 4S, completely flyable. So I would assume that seven inch 1600 kV 6S would be no problem. You might even be able to go lower if you want to get longer flight times, or you might just use a throttle curve. So since I'm not sure how much lower you could go, I would say look at something like 6S, 1600 to 1700 kV, and if you want to extend your flight time, try using a throttle curve to reduce, to reduce it. That's where I would go. And then the last question, Dexter, is what motor do you need? I wouldn't go, I wouldn't go smaller than like 2306, 2207. I think 7-inch, I've heard from other people who say that 7-inch does a little better on like a, a bigger motor. So you might be looking at something like, oh, like the J, I have a, my, my motor is 2407, 1750 kV. That might be a little higher kV than you want. But you might look at like a 2207, 2208, 2407-ish motor, maybe 2306, nothing smaller than that though. Hope that was worth 10 bucks to you. <laughs> Kyle Strait, 5S 2150 KV, good mix of freestyle and long range. Kyle, 5S 2150 KV is like the mid. That's, I base everything off of 4S because that's just what I'm used to. 5S 2150 KV, let's do the math. I'll show you guys how to do the math. 5S versus 4S. So what we want to do is convert from 5S to 4S. 5 out of 4 is 1.25. 2150 KV on 5S times 1.25 is 2687 KV on 4S. So 5S 2150 KV, 2700 KV on 4S is a little high, but it's actually, there's a little bit of nonlinearity here. Like 4S 2700 KV would be a bit of a battery killer, but 5S 2150 KV is kind of okay. So I feel like that's firmly rooted in the freestyle performance. And if you're looking for cruising on 5S, you'd want to come down to like 2,000, 1,900 kV, give up a little power, or use, try using a throttle curve. B42 now in the in the Discord has a super hot motor. No, you do not have a super hot motor. Never mind. 
Okay. Che Brandon says, what's your recommendation if I have bounce back on pitch? Fine on roll. Beta flight 403. Che Brandon, um, the real way to know why you're getting bounce back is to use black box and look at the PIDs. But many of us don't have the option to, or the knowledge to do that. And we're just guessing. The, the beta flight devs f have indicated that a lot of times bounce back in beta flight uh, 4.0 is re related to iTerm windup. Now, iTerm relax in beta flight 4.0 is supposed to fix this. So what I suggest you do, Che Brandon, is if you're getting bounce back on pitch, take your pitch eye gain way down. Like cut it in half, cut it in a, by a third. I'm not suggesting you fly this way. This is just a troubleshooting tip technique. So take your eye gain on pitch down by like Take it to a third of its value, just way low, and then fly and see if that fixes the bounce back. And if that fixes the bounce back, you know the bounce back is eye term wind up, and you can try and tune your eye gain maybe to fix that. BA wants to know a beta flight Lua script working on the jumper T16. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. I have to answer a message. Um, here's what I'm going to find for you guys. Give me one second. I have, uh, the question is about getting T16 Lua scripts working. And I have an email from somebody who told me how he got them working. And I'm trying to find it. Oh, I don't want to waste too much of your time. Guys, I'm going to try just a minute more to try to find this for you guys. And then I'm going to give up. Uh, I know it's here. Bear with me. If I could tell you how to get the Lua script working, it would be amazing. I have instructions for it, but I don't want to waste your time on the live stream. Just one second longer. Oh, I did. I see it. Oh, please. No. Nope. All right. I can't find it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't find it. All right. I do have an, a video uh, instructions from somebody who got Lua scripts working on the. <sighs> Why can't I find it? I'm so annoyed. I know it's right here. No. All right. I give up. Sorry, guys. Um, okay. Sorry. All right, let's get another question. <laughs> How can I become as knowledgeable as me? Um, my background, CRB1, uh, I, my background, ha I, I've always been into computers and electronics. I have a degree in computer science from Georgia Tech, although I've never been a professional programmer. I have enough background in programming. I was a, I, you know, I did, pro when I was a kid, I did some programming in Pascal, you know, just from a book, examples from a book. Um, so I have, I, I, I learned programming as a hobby as a kid. Uh, when I asked me what uh, I wanted to major in, and I knew I was going to college. I picked Georgia Tech because it was in-state. Uh, and, and I was like, well, I guess that's, I don't, you know, I'm going to go to an in-state college because it's cheaper. Georgia Tech, uh, they asked me what my major wa wanted to be, and I, I ended up on computer science. I learned some programming in college, but I never actually became a professional programmer. Uh, when I got out of college, I, I became a, an instructor, a classroom instructor, a uh, corporate classroom, not college or anything. Basically, you bought our software and then you came to our class to learn how to use it. And the software was a computer network analyzer. So I got into computer networking, um, ended up doing Wi-Fi instruction and troubleshooting for a long time. Uh, and I started making YouTube videos at some point. 
that's the gist of it. How do you get to be as smart as me? I don't I don't really know the answer. I mean, I just uh I'm I feel like I'm constantly on the threshold of being irrelevant. Uh, like there's things that I learned a lot about, I get excited about and learn a lot about them, but then I just kind of get focused in on them and the, and the and things move on and I don't always keep up. So I try to stay up on the latest stuff. I try to pay attention to questions. It's really good to have questions that you guys ask me because I know what you need help with and then I can try and learn about it. Mostly I learn about these things by talking to, there was a time when I wanted to learn about black box logging and, and black box troubleshooting. And I just spent hours and hours thinking about them and learning about them and creating new knowledge about them. Uh, today, I, I touch on so many topics that original new knowledge is more difficult to come by because that's very inefficient to make new knowledge. A lot of what I do today is talk to other people who are spending hours and hours working on things and uh, and then just sort of regurgitate their knowledge. But I still feel like I have a talent for c communicating them. Like if you were to sit down with Mark Spatz, a lot of people to sit down with him and talk to him about PID tuning would walk away with their head spinning. Some people would be like, oh, this guy's, this guy, I get it. And that's cool. So one of the talents that I think I have is just communicating this stuff in a way that more people can understand. And that's what I bring to the table. But a lot of what I do is just regurgitate what other, what other people tell me in a little bit, in a little bit more uh, digestible way. Let's see what we got here. Would setting notch filters be the best way to target certain frequencies? Should I use D-term notch or gyro notch? Um, the thing is, JB edits, the gyro notch, the advantage of the gyro notch is that when you filter the gyro data, both the D-term and the gyro experience the same phase delay. One of the problems with D-term filtering is that the D-term filtering will delay the, the D-term and, the, and it gets out of sync or out of phase with the gyro. So by using gyro filtering, you delay both of them equally and they stay in phase, but you need a lot more filtering uh, to get a, a enough effect. So the exact way to get the right balance between D-term and gyro notch, actually, I don't have like a shorthand there. I don't think it's easy to boil that down. I usually go with guidelines from people who are a lot more experienced than me, like Mark Spatz, uh, and they just go, yeah, I think you should do this. Um, the real way to troubleshoot this is to use a tool like Mark Spatz has his spreadsheet, which show the filter delay calculator spreadsheet. And uh, then you could, you could say, how much attenuation do I get at 170 hertz versus how much delay if I have this combination of filters? And you can try and find the best combination of filters that produces enough attenuation at the frequency of interest versus the delay. Personally, I just always filter the gyro because that that will have the maximum effect on the filtering. It has extra delay, but I'm just like, ah, I just filter the gyro. So that's, yeah, there you go. A name that I can't possibly pronounce. It's just a long string of letters and numbers. Thank you. That you're not going to get a call out with a name like that. Tip, thanks for 10 bucks. I have a JBF4, AIO, and 4 in 1. I want GPS, but Crossfire is using UART 6. VTX is using UART 4. Where can I get TXRX for GPS? The, the, op, the answer to your question is to use the LED strip pad. Remap LED strip as soft serial and use that for smart audio. Then put your VTX on the LED strip pad, and then you have UART 4 for GPS. The other workaround is to connect the uh, Smart Audio VTX to pin IO4 on the Crossfire receiver. And then you can use the Crossfire Lua script or the Crossfire module to control the, the VTX. Um, if, but you won't be able to use the OSD if you connect the VTX directly to the Crossfire receiver. Yeah, that's the workaround. Yep, Christopher Kahn, that's exactly right. 
Spartan FPV says my EV200DR only giving me a quarter of the range of others with the same antennas. Spartan FPV, what you're doing with this with this process of elimination troubleshooting, let me just compliment you on that first of all. A lot of people, this is just a really basic troubleshooting approach and troubleshooting skill and a, just a, a troubleshooting philosophy that everybody should learn. When uh, you start with a problem, I have bad video range. Then what do you do? Change one thing. So use your goggles to look at your buddy's quad. Do you have good range now? Well, then it's your quad. That's the problem. Have your buddy use his goggles to look at your quad. Right? So switch both ways and start doing this process of elimination. So let's assume Spartan FPV that you and your buddy are both looking at the exact same quad, not you looking at your quad and him looking at his, because then it could be your quad, it could be your goggles, you don't know. And that's where that process of elimination comes in. If you are both looking at the same quad and you get short range and he gets long range, you know that it's not the VTX. You know that it's not the, the transmitter antenna. What could it be? It's the things that are different between those two scenarios. It's your goggles, it's your receiver module, it's your antennas. So then you could try swapping antennas, right? You could try, now here's a problem. The EV200Ds, they have RPSMA connectors on the modules. Most every other goggle has SMA connectors. So chances are that his antennas won't go on your goggles. You could try different modules. The EV200D can take a standard Fat Shark module. Um, these are some of the places I would go from here. Just continue using that process of elimination to try and figure out which specific component is having the issue. Mark Fifnera has a good suggestion. Check your polarization. The goggles and the quad both must have the same polarization, right hand or left hand polarization. If you have accidentally put a left-hand antenna on the quad and a right-hand antenna on the goggles, then you're going to run into problems. MC Creations points out the RPSMA connectors could be bad. Um, Mark Fifnera uh, says check if the antenna connectors are right. Well, actually, Mark, this is one advantage of the RPSMA connectors on the EV200D modules. The RPSMA connector, the module will have the pin on the connector. It is impossible to accidentally plug an SMA antenna into an RPSMA module. The pins will not let you. So if you have SMA connectors on your module, you could accidentally plug an RPSMA antenna into the module and then you'll get bad range. But if you have an RPSMA module, you cannot accidentally plug in the incorrect antenna unless you're using like a right angle adapter and then you, you could adapt it either way. Yeah. Fifnera, is that not how you say it? Marek Fifnera, is that not, that's what it just sounds like. Marek, that's just what it sounds like. It's possible. Yeah, you can remember RPSMA. Well, I mean, you could just memorize it basically. Is that not how you say your name though? Well, anyway. Spartan FPV says right hand on both, both axes. All right, so definitely that. Spartan FPV, if I were you, the next thing I would. Fifnera. F I F. Oh, Fiferga. Fiferna. Oh, my goodness. How about that? You know how many times I looked at that and spelled it out in my head and read it and still got it wrong? Americ, uh, some people call me Joshua Bardell. So I guess we're even. <laughs> um, uh, what I would do, Spartan, is I would take a module. Just ask your friend, can I, can I use your module real quick? Pull the, pull the module out of his goggles, plug it into your goggles. Only use, so the EV200D support quadversity. Only use one module at a time. Pull both modules out of your EV200D, plug in his module, and see if you get crap range. Indigo Rhino says, when I plug the new Mamba F7 into Betaflight, the quad spins slowly. It's this bad. Indigo, you were talking about in the setup tab. Um, and the, the flight controller is just sitting on the table, but the, the 3D model is kind of going just slowly drifting. That is very common. It probably doesn't indicate anything, and you'll probably have no problems in flight. 
If it's like going bonkers, then your gyro is messed up. Zero FPV says, hey, Josh, why does Betaflight 4 have such high I terms? For all my quads, it's way too high. Zero FPV, Betaflight 4 is going for a very different stick feel. They're going for a stick feel. What they've got is the eye gain is super high, which makes the quad feel super stiff. But then they have feed forward and eye term relax. And these two things together overcome the eye gain when you move the sticks. And what they're going for, to me, it feels a lot like Flight 1 sim mode, although I would, I would never suggest that the devs intentionally set out to emulate that. But they do feel very similar. Um... What I would suggest you do, Zero FPV, is look for my video, Betaflight 4.0 PID Tune for your perfect stick feel. And it shows you how to adjust the feed forward and the iTerm relax settings to get a different stick feel. But I have to tell you, when I, Zero FPV, when I first flew Betaflight 4.0, I hated the stick feel. I was like, I guess I see why you could like this, but I want the old one back. And I actually went back to 357 and was like, oh, Hang on, this is actually worse. The stick feel for Betaflight 4.0 actually, in my opinion, gives more precise and better controlled flight. You're just not used to it yet, is what I would suggest. So zero FPV, I would say give Betaflight 4.0's default PID tune like five or ten packs and then go back and see if you, it actually feels really loose and maybe not as good. Let's see here. Axes, Marek points out axes can get broken internally. Try other antennas, yeah. <laughs> Marek says, Flight One does something amazing. Flight One does something. OMG, amazing! BF devs do something. OMG, why did you change it? Later. Why is BF never doing anything new? Yeah. Some truth there. Red October RC wants to know how much interference a GoPro causes for crossfire. Red October, the GoPro's Wi-Fi is going to be active in 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Crossfire is down at 900 megahertz. I wouldn't expect there to be much issue. Uh, if you really care, turn off the GoPro's Wi-Fi, although I personally always fly with the GoPro's Wi-Fi turned on so that if my GoPro comes off my quad in a crash, I take out my cell phone and I just hold it up and I hit connect, 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 and try and connect to it. So I can, And then you can actually, there's a lost GoPro finder setting in the GoPro uh, app, which causes it to start beeping. Let's see here. Elevated Customs, the 3M stuff you're not able to remember the name is Dual Lock. 3M Dual Lock is what I like instead of uh, instead of Velcro. Mind Man TV wants to know why is it that the gyro has to be rotated 100 degree, 180 degrees in some F4 boards? Mind Man TV, Betaflight 4.0 introduced a new feature called Universal Targets. Um, the target is the definition of pins and other internal resources on the flight controller that it, basically each flight controller design needs its own target. Um, and right now, the only way to make a new target is for the Betaflight devs to compile that in and it's a lot of work for the Betaflight devs to make and maintain new targets. There are currently over 150 targets that the devs maintain, and it's a lot of work for them. The universal targets function redoes the architecture and the way that targets are defined so that... Hang on. <coughs> Pardon me. So that it's easier for a third party to create a new target without the devs having to be involved. In other words... Vendors can release new flight controllers with new targets without creating additional work for the beta flight devs. And that's good. If, if, if I'm going to release a new flight controller and I need a new target for it, why should the devs have to do that? Why not let me do it? Why not let the devs focus on what they do best? Well, when they changed to the universal targets, 
the way that the gyro orientation was recorded for a couple flight controllers did, did not convert over. And it means that when you go from 357 to 4.0 on some flight controllers, like the Maytek F405 is one of them, I believe, or I think, you have to change the gyro orientation to 180 degrees. That's unfortunate. But hopefully this new, uh, this new like universal targets is going to have a big advantage. <laughs> JB Edits wants to know, is it all right to store my lipos at 15.1 or 15.3? The best storage for lipos is 3.8 volts per cell. If you're at 3.81 or 3.82, it probably doesn't freaking matter. But 3.8 is nominally where it needs to be. Ingo B wants to know, have I done any flight practice beginner educational videos? Yes. I have a long time ago, actually. It's been a while. I might should... No, 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 no. I might should update them. Where is it? There it is. So, uh, yeah. I've got a, a playlist with Learn to Fly videos. I have to say, I, I actually think there are... I think there's probably some better ones out there. But if you want one from me, here it is. Here's my video, Learn to Fly. This is my playlist. Uh, another one that's, I think some, I think I saw that, pardon me, Velocidrone has a series. Yeah, Velocidrone Flight Training. Um, I don't, I actually haven't watched this whole series, but um, if you have Velocidrone, I mean, it's 35 videos. It's got to be freaking decent, right? So let's, let's throw that in there. IV says, I don't know, but with the devs always making previous targets, should I trust that vendors will do it correctly? Well, IV, if the vendor doesn't make the target correctly, then when you try and fly the board, it, it like it won't work. It'll flip out or some of the pins, won't, the motors won't spin. I mean, the vendor has done everything else correctly. The, ve the reason the vendors don't make their own targets now is mostly because the devs like don't, don't let them. Like, the, I mean, that's not entirely true. Right now, when a, when a vendor makes a new target, a lot of times the devs will say, well, we're not doing the work for you. Please submit a pull request, right? And we will, we will merge the pull request and leave it to the vendor to do the work. But the problem is that it's just not a very easy interface and to do it. And this new universal targets will make it easier for vendors to do it. Um, you have to trust. I mean, the vendor did everything else about the board correctly. The vendor has already created the pin mappings and stuff. They did that when they invented the board. So if the vendor is capable of creating a whole flight controller, they can also create the target. The devs are just giving them the interface to do it. So yeah, IV, I would expect the, the devs to do it correctly. <laughs> Let's see here. Slightly Bent wants to know, how low should you fly your batteries before you land? I've been flying to just storage because then I don't have to do a storage charge when I get home. Slightly Bent, in my experience, if you, pardon me, if you fly until your battery is at about 3.7 or 3.6 volts, then after you land, it'll kind of rebound to about 3.8 volts. And that's, that's what I like to do as well. In my experience, if you fly the battery below about 3.7 or 3.6 volts, when you land, it'll be at about 3.7 volts. But more importantly, while you're flying, it's going to fly like crap. It's going to sag out and it may even go below 3.0 volts, in which case it's taking permanent damage. This is especially relevant on 6S packs. On 4S packs, by the time you're down around 3.6 volts, as with most batteries, as soon as you touch the throttle, it goes and sags out. And you're like, I guess I better land. I find it really easy to land 4S packs and have them be at about 3.8 volts, maybe 3.75, because much lower than that, and they just fly like crap anyway. So you may as well land and put a new one on. But three, but 6S batteries, 
they hold voltage so well that it's so easy to fly a 6S down to 3.3 volts or even lower. And you're just like, yeah, it's good. And then the battery just goes, because now you're at 3.0 volts or 2.9 volts and you've destroyed it. So, but for 4S, it's, re it's really easy. I generally want the battery resting at 3.8 volts when I land. If I'm pushing the pack, it's safe to go lower, but performance will be worse. And you never want it to go below 3.0 volts or it'll take permanent damage. If I land the battery and it's resting at 3.5, 3.6, chances are that in flight it went it went too low and I may have damaged it. So. Yeah, I've destroyed I got to tell you guys, I've almost never destroyed a 4S by over discharging it. The only time I destroy a 4S by over discharging it is when like let's say I'm I'm wanting to do freestyle to a certain song and it's like a four and a half minute song. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do this all in one take. And then at the end the battery's just like beep, 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 beep. But the problem the, the 4S has almost this built in self protection where it starts flying like crap before you damage it. And you're just like, I got nothing. I guess I'll land. But 6S just stays good until you destroy it. And I've I've destroyed three or four 6S packs. I don't fly 6S that often either. But just, you're just, part of it is that I don't know the 6S cutoff voltage. Like I like 4S, I just know. I If you're going to fly 5S and 6S, definitely in the OSD, turn on the average cell voltage instead of the pack voltage. Because then you'll just know, oh, I'm at 3.6. But 6S just feels so good all the way down to like 3.4, 3.3. You just like keep flying it. If you're not paying attention, you just kill it. It's bad. How many batteries have died because the song is so good you want to fly the rest of the song chamber? That is it. That's how I, I'm like, yeah, I'm really into this song. It's so good. Oh, I killed a battery. Hope it was worth it. Red October RC wants to know how much difference between cells is too much. The cells should come down really close, like within 0 0.1, I think. And just I'm just making that up. But like if I land and the cells are at like 3.65, 3.68, 3.69. Yeah, if I land and one's at like 3.7 and one's at 3.8, that's pretty weird to me. I have noticed that some 6S packs seem to get unbalanced more easily than 4S packs. I don't know if that's universally true, though. I'm still gathering data. And that actually matters because if you're looking at the pack voltage, let's say you've got the pack voltage. I'm going to use a calculator here so I don't screw up the math because I'm just I'm lazy with math especially when I'm talking. But if we take 3.0, let's take 3.1 volts times 6 cells is 18.6 volts. Let's say I look at the pack voltage it's 18.6 volts and that means that my average is 3.1. But that assumes that the pack is 100% balanced. If the pack has gotten imbalanced, we could have one cell at 2.9 and one cell at 3.2. And my average is 18.6, but the pack is, is being damaged. And that's one problem with 6S. If your 6S pack doesn't maintain very good balance, then simply looking at the pack voltage or the average cell voltage will mislead you. You could get into a scenario where you've got one cell that's much lower and it's getting damaged, even though the average pack cell voltage is, is above 3.0. Nikotin689 so. wants to know why no one talks about 5S. Well, the racers started talking about 6S, and everybody got into it. Uh, 5S is a very interesting middle ground between raw performance and uh, tunability and, and flight time. But the thing is, like 6S, why didn't they go to 7S or 8S? Well, 6S is something about the electronics. They, they tend to cap out at 6S, and once you get above 6S, the electronics are way, way more expensive. So everybody's higher voltage is better. I would pro I, I, as I learned by flying the Holy Bro uh, Copus too, uh, with the twenty one fifty kV Stingy motors. Um, I found that with twenty one fifty kV, you could just run six S and put a throttle limit on it, and it actually flew great. 
So, Also, odd numbers are gross. Good point, Ben Kaminsky. 5S, 5 odd numbers, please. <laughs> Sam says, Josh, could you do a test with copper tape on the flight controller to see if it helps with gyro noise? Sam, the answer is yes, it does. Uh, yes, it does. Um, if you have a flight controller with a gyro mounted on the underside of the flight controller and you're using a 4-in-1 ESC, flip the flight controller upside down so that the gyro is on top away from the ESC and or add some foil copper tape to the ESC to shield it. It does make a difference. Okay. Wow, the time has flown, guys. Wow, it's 3.01 p.m. It's 3.01 p.m. Skip Ward says, how do I know when to buy? So much new stuff daily. Skip, in general, just buy. There's never a perfect time to buy. Um, if you buy something that just got released, you're going to pay a little bit more for it. If you buy something that is not the latest and greatest, you'll get a better price, but you'll risk that something good will come out next week. And in that sense, I'm going to remind you guys that if you're – Thinking about buying the SkyZone SkyO2 or any other goggle, you should wait until the middle of this week and then make your decision. I can't say any more than that because I shouldn't because uh, because and I'm not and I apologize if when you find out some of you are going to find out what the news I'm talking about is and go, oh, I didn't care about that. I would love to be able to – anything more that I say would be revealing too much though. So there's going to be some collateral damage here. A few of you were about to pull the trigger on these goggles, and when you find out why I told you to wait, you'll be like, oh, I'm glad I waited. Thank you, Joshua. Many of you will be like, oh, I didn't care about that, and I apologize. But in the, in the interest of doing good, there will be some collateral damage, and that will be the few days that you waited. <laughs> If you hear this news and you're getting super excited and you're like, oh, what must this mean? Just wait. Don't get too excited. Just wait. RC Dude, I do like the Yashin trash can. It's a good one. I have a review of it. You can check it out. Yeah, see, Redbeard the pilot, uh, I do, I, this, obviously this is an NDA issue and the problem is that I would like to try to find a way to uh, help you guys out and spend your money smartly without breaking my NDA. And I figure if I just say without any additional details, don't buy anything until the middle of the week. No one could accuse me of breaking an NDA for saying don't buy anything till the middle of the week. I hope no one would accuse me of doing that. But I'm not giving you one single piece of additional information because the minute I start giving you little breadcrumbs about the details, now somebody's going to be mad at me for, for breaking the NDA. So I'm not telling you one more thing. That you just say, you just got to live with it. Okay. That's going to do it. That's going to do it. Yeah, right. Southwest Kitty, uh, waiting, waiting a couple more days. If you're going to pull the trigger today and you wait three or four more days, that's eh, not going to make a big difference. That's going to do it, guys. It's 3 o'clock. We've been going for about two hours. We're going to finish up the live stream. Thank you so much for sticking around, watching. Thank you so much to all the patrons in the Discord uh, for supporting me via Patreon.com. Link in the video description. Thank you to everybody who gave Super Chats as well for supporting me that way. And thanks to everybody who just showed up. If I did a live stream and no one showed up, it'd be super lame. Um, I have another live stream tomorrow, Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern. I Lately, I'm streaming at 1 p.m. Sunday and 8 p.m. Monday, two live streams a day. I'll be here. You'll be here. We'll have a good time. Look for videos coming this week on my channel, Free Sky Access setup videos, uh, flashing firmware to the RXSR, updating the firmware on the Free Sky uh, X9 Lite, and just generally talking about free sky access that's mainly what i'm focusing on this week in terms of tutorials going to have maybe some product review of the x9 light or the uh, x light pro um obviously i have these goggles i, I i'm due to do a review of these we'll find out about those uh, i don't know if that's going to be this week or not but um yeah that's what's coming up on the channel thank you guys so much uh, we are going to sign off happy flying everybody <laughs>